Good morning. Um, in case you haven't noticed, I'm not Patrick Chenzo, uh, who was supposed to attend the, who was scheduled for this talk, but he could not attend because he had um, an important commitment in New York. But he sends his regards and deepest apologies. Um, as a French Parisian uh, living in the heart of a very neighborhood that was hit by the attack last Friday, um, I would like to take a chance um, to say a word, so please forgive my accent. Salam alaikum, baraka frasek. The past events are tragic, and I want to send my thoughts to my friends who are still lying in, a, in hospitals and the families of the missing ones. May peace be on them. So please let's observe a moment of silence together. Thank you. So now a few words about myself. My name is Michel Courtin, and I've been building platforms my whole life. Um, I started, I had a previous life as a DevOps, um, but I'll start my story through the BBC when I uh, wrote the very first Flash player um, from scratch in C, uh, running on embedded uh, small devices, um, which became a platform that enabled iPlayer. For those of you who live in the UK, you probably know it. Um, then I worked in, the, I get back to my passion, video games, uh, and joined MKO Games to build a tool, a cross-platform uh, engine and platform that was used for all the internal productions. And then I started running my own business, uh, iVoltage, um, where I started with, you know, writing little games in a garage and very quickly um, signed contracts with hardware manufacturers such as Orange, Intel, PrimeSense, well, it was actually uh, quite refreshing to see the previous IoT demo. Uh, really cool stuff. Um, and um, to do that, uh, usually hardware manufacturers would come to me with their device uh, and needed applications to uh, showcase uh, the capabilities. So I would tailor solution uh, using C++ to leverage as much performance and uh, wrapping it in Lua for uh, flexibility. And uh, back in March, I was going to GDC, um, as I do every year in San Francisco. And I'm always uh, crashing at Solomon's uh, flat. And um, he was telling me about Docker as a platform and how it was turning. And uh, I was telling him about my platform. And he, we just realized that we were in very different, very different infrastructures, really solving the same problem, which is make developers' life easier and maximize creative iterations. So just a few, a few words, because I, I just landed last night. So I, I landed from DockerCon in Barcelona, which was a great event. Um, I would like to ask a few questions. Uh, how many of you are more like devs or ops? Could, could devs raise their hands? Wow, lots of devs. And how many of you are ops? OK. Great, good to know. Um, so I guess nobody uses Docker in production here yet. Ah, yay! Congrats, too. Well, wow, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, how much of you, free, <laughs> and four. How much of you, um, uh, how many of you, sorry, um, are using Windows as their development platform? Don't be ashamed, you know, there's nothing wrong with Windows. Uh, I like Windows. Uh, most of video game tools uh, were on Windows for a, uh, only on Windows for a long time. And um, how many of you are developing on Macs? Oh, it's okay. It's an even spread. Um, and um, how many of you are using Kitematic? Or I've no oh, a few hands and Docker Compose. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, maybe Swarm, Docker Swarm. Yeah. You'll see I have some really exciting stuff to show you about Swarm. So just a little bit of background. Uh, Docker is an open source project um, that has a, an immense community, about 2,000 contributors. And uh, it's not just contributors uh, from San Francisco. Uh, they come from 63 different countries, organizing 215 groups. Uh, and to give you some numbers, um, Right now, we have 240K Dockerized applications, 60,000 Docker-related projects on GitHub. Um, we, we, have, we just hit the 10,000 uh, pull request milestone. 
Can you imagine that? It's, it's insane. We, we close 200 pull requests a week. I'm talking about closing them. And so a few uh, big numbers, it ends up, uh, in terms of usage, uh, it's 1.3 billion uh, Docker Hub pools, which in other ways is 5.6 million pools every day, or 65 per second, you know, like 65, 130, that's what it is right now. Uh, so this creates, that's what I call traction, really. <laughs> and um, this, such attraction creates a wall ecosystem around it, um, everybody wants to be in. So welcome to the jungle. You know, we have Amazon and Microsoft and Google offering infrastructure services. Tutum, that we just announced uh, that we acquired. Uh, great, great team based in Spain, uh, in New York. And uh, on top of that, we have orchestration layers, uh, such as Swarm, our internal uh, stack, or Mesos, wi more widely used in production, or Kubernetes from Google. And uh, it's not just like uh, a super um, a tool for devs to be happy and that is not really production ready. Uh, here are some of the uh, brands that uh, actually use Docker in production and you, you can see the BBC, Yelp, eBay, Disney, uh, you know, big names. So let's jump back into the future because I don't know if you guys noticed, but like a month back, it was the day Marty McFly set uh, to jump into the future. And um, I'm sorry to say, guys, but we still don't have flying skateboards. Uh, but I believe that uh, just like William Gibson, um, the future is now, it's just not evenly distributed. You know, all the elements are here and it's really about putting the pieces together. And uh, so what we're trying to do is to minimize um, the creative loop, and, uh, which makes our mission um, a holy mission to build tools of mass innovation. What we really want at Docker is to make your life, guys, easier. Um, you know, it's, it can be a mess. The internet is uh, very fragmented. And so we separate uh, at the moment are different steps into, uh, in between build, ship, and run, uh, meaning you can build your application locally, uh, you can ship it as an um, immutable unit and run it on the cloud. And I'm not talking about uh, locking you down into a stack. I'm talking about any application, any software stack, any old stuff that your customer <coughs> requires that is boring, that you can actually now encapsulate into a container and move it around. And you can run it anywhere. You can run it locally on your computer, uh, share it with your developer friend, and have exactly the same uh, react, uh, reaction, the, the same output. Or run it in the cloud and have no surprises. You know, I hear stories sometimes of projects uh, in large companies, of course, uh, that took just uh, a few months to develop and, and nine months to get into production. And can you imagine how big of an impact it has um, on, on the, the cost of a product. Um, and basically, the, the internet uh, is extremely fragmented, and that's what generates all this disparity. You, you've got a hardware layer that is made of very different architecture, very different software and language stacks, um, and um, what we, but the technology is very fragmented. But, and, but think about it, the internet is something really amazing. It's been around for like, what, 60 years? Never broke. No one ever turned it off. So what we decided to do is to create a platform, a software layer to program the internet, because eventually that's what it is. And uh, when you have a rich ecosystem like this, uh, because a lot of people are wondering what is the, um, business model uh, of Docker. That's like one, one of the number one question I'll probably get at the end. <laughs> um, but it creates a lot of business opportunities because when you, when you get to that kind of volume, um, new models start to emerge and you, you don't have to have an entry uh, level for a lot of your um, customers. And you know, CEOs uh, see the money in it because what it does is hide all the complexity of building an app uh, and, you know, there's this guy that just knows how to do it. Well, now we tell him to do it once using Docker files, 
and we had all this complexity and is no longer completely indispensable. But as Boromir would say, one does not simply build a pass. <laughs> um, because time, you know, building a pass is kind of too, too long and you, you spend a lot of energy not focusing on a product. And time to market is essential. You know, if you miss your timeline, you, the competition will take care of you. Um, and so there is this probably the worst acronym ever, MT Biamsh. I'm not sure about how to pronounce it. But well, I like the idea behind it, which is mean time between idea and making stuff happen. Um, more simply, I like to call it um, um, creative iteration loop, which is how long does it take in between your idea being, being coded, because we all know that writing the code is, is just one percent of, of programming. The, the, real, the real problems start to appear when you ship into production. So what we're trying to provide is agility, because agility uh, saves time, and we all know time is money. So, you know, it's a really important thing. So now let's have a little look at uh, the DevOps uh, history. Initially, we had mainframe, you know, pretty simple, one push from one side, uh, passive clients. Then we evolved into client-server architecture, uh, struggle, you know. <laughs> then the web um, showed up controlling both aspects. And finally, we're getting to an era where developers and um, ops can stop fighting and actually work together. And I even think that ops is becoming part of development because it's, it's no longer just an app that you run on your computer. You know, it's, it's a whole system that has to work together and be shipped together. Uh, let's look at why Docker is so different. Um, and again, um, let's uh, scroll back, back in time. The traditional architecture pre-2000 was one server, one application, single stack, single language. If you needed more compute, simple, you needed more servers. Uh, well, that turns out to be very expensive, slow, and inefficient. And then around the years 2000, virtualization appeared uh, with products such as VMware, um, which meant one server equals multiple VMs and multiple stacks, multiple application. You needed more compute? You just added a few VMs on your nodes, and you could have them running uh, completely isolated. Great. Uh, fantastic. You know, you could have Windows running on Macs, uh, Linux running on OS X. Um, you know, that's, that, that really changed uh, something. But it still emulated the whole hardware stack. You know, you still had to have a separate memory space, and uh, this was very costly in terms of CPU and memory. Um, and the solution that we brought, well, I, I wouldn't say we brought, but we, we actually democratized, uh, is the intermodal shipping container. Think about it as, as a box that you stuff with things, and you can move it around, and you just don't care about what's inside. You just pass it to the next step, whether it's to QA, your developer friends, or live. And it just behaves the same. You know, when I started, when I discovered Docker, um, I was just amazed by all the capabilities. For me, it's, it's a real new Lego brick uh, that has been invented. So it re heavily relies, so what, what's the trick behind it? Well, the trick is that we don't um, emulate the whole hardware stack at all. Instead, we do a lot of tricks. So there's a lot of complex terms here that you don't really have to know. Really, there's three key, uh, key parts. First is namespacing of processes, uh, making sure that uh, all the processes of a container only see each other and don't see the other processes. But they're really running on the host. And this is the key difference. We, we get um, the full capacity of a CPU, uh, all the memory. The memory is not fragmented anymore. Um, so that's one, namespacing. Then we need uh, file system virtualization if we're going to make that process believe that is running inside his own operating system, inside the operating system, uh, we need him to have his uh, file system uh, virtualized. And finally, all these containers need to communicate with each other, um, and that's why we have network virtualization, so that each containers and services can have their own IP and communicate together. 
Um, so then we structure things into layers uh, for flexibility, because really what we have at the bottom, <coughs> at the bottom is a kernel uh, that uh, references a base image, uh, which would be like the operating system you, you want. Uh, like here I chose Debian, which is like one of the most common use, uh, but you could have something as small as BuzzyBox. And then you add layers of content on top of the operating system, such as Emacs or Apache, and finally a writable container. So let's have a look at how technically it happens for developers. Um, here you have a, what we call a Docker file, so it's a description of how the service should be built. Um, so you have a from statement uh, that here pulls uh, the latest the Java 7 uh, image that itself references a Debian. Uh, so ba -ba -bam, we already have a stack just by, with one statement, we have a Linux machine uh, that runs Debian and that has uh, the Java runtime uh, and a JDK installed on it. And then we copy dot where our source file, a source code resides and uh, put it inside slash user slash src slash my app. And we define a working deer uh, to the same path so we don't have to type long complicated path. And finally, we just run Java C uh, main to Java to, and the last step is, of course, to execute it. So that's it, really. Here we have um, a container that builds uh, your source code and creates an immutable image that you can run anywhere. Um, and to build that image, pretty simple, Docker build, uh, not extremely creative, <laughs> and uh, you Really what you need to do is docker build dot, and it's gonna look for a docker file in the di directory. Uh, but what is convenient is to tag, minus T stands for tag, is to tag it with a name so you can reference it in the next uh, commands. So then you can just do a docker run, uh, minus IT stands for interaction, RM to remove it, and you name, uh, you reference for my running app, and, uh, and there you go, it tr it's running. And it's really running instantaneously, it's not like, Super slow or anything, um, but some, sometimes you want you don't want to execute the application at the same time. So here, the last line shows you how to um, actually do exactly the same thing as uh, the Docker file at the top, but all in one command that just compiles. So there you go. Now the container is not an application; it's just a building environment, which secures and guarantees that. Developer A will build your app the same way as developer B. Another great feature. Because, you know, that's, it's a very versatile tool. It took me about, first time I really started to play with it, it took me about a week to really sink in all the concepts and all the possibilities that it opened. Uh, Docker Compose, um, well, right now I described how to start and run one, uh, one stack, but we all know that services uh, are not just like one process running uh, on a box. They're usually composed of, you know, web front end, worker processes, databases. So you need them to work together and um, uh, they form a whole that you want to be shipped and moved around as a unit. So here you have uh, two containers that are being described. You have, we just named them. If you look at the top level um, uh, tags, you have a web container that is just a label that we chose and a Redis container. So let's look at the Redis container. It's very simple. Just like the, in the Docker file we referenced uh, Java 7 uh, before, here it's just referencing a Redis uh, image. So it means it's gonna pull an image and, and build and run it. And then for the web, because it's our source code, there's a, a little bit more tricks, but you know, still stands in like, what's, uh, nine, uh, seven lines. And it's gonna instruct to build uh, the current directory and then to run a Python app. You see, uh, we were doing Java, now we're doing Python. And, uh, and it's going to export uh, the port 5000 from your, um, so it's visible from the outside of a container and remap it to the port 5000 inside your app. Here the Python app export, uh, binds a port of the port 5000. And then um, mount the source code into slash code, you know, because again, it's, it's a completely new distro, uh, fresh. We don't have to follow the Unix standards and we can just put the code into slash code or into slash hello. 
You don't care. It's just going to be a, a, the same every time. And finally, we'll link these two containers. So you see, we find these three fundamentals that I named before, uh, which is process isolation, um, file system virtualization, and network virtualization. Oh, sorry, my, my thing lost the connection. OK. Uh, Docker machine. Yeah, it's working. Um, Docker machine. So right now, so far, I've only been talking about how we develop locally or how we compose a, um, a complex stack. Uh, but at some point, you're going to want that into production. And again, production environment can be very fragmented. You have uh, Amazon, AWS, or Azure. And uh, Docker machine provides an abstraction layer that allows you to address any remote node on any hosting provider or your own node um, in the same way as you would locally. And uh, yeah, that's a summary of the cloud providers and different operating systems that you can uh, run into it, but really there's no limit. And Kitematic is a uh, high level uh, user interface that uh, allows you, and that's for those of you who want to start using Docker, that's where I recommend uh, you put your first efforts. You just download an app and install it, and uh, it's going to offer you a bunch of images. We have, I showed you the number of images that we have. Um, I think that almost any source base uh, that was available as open source has already been ported to, to Docker. You know, any complex stack, think about it before you had like, Things like Gitorious, I remember that, that, that used to be. It had an install procedure that was that long. Now this, well, and I never managed to do it. Like I tried a couple of times. I never managed to install it. Now if I want to if I wanna do it, which I don't, but I, all I have to do is Docker run uh, Gitorious. Easy. And, and it's going to work anywhere. Um, so Kitmatic is going to offer you a high level uh, interface showing you, allowing you to, to fetch any uh, any image and run it and see the status and have a little preview, but I have a little video that I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, Docker Hub, so we need a place, uh, is the cloud, Docker Hub is Docker's cloud service for publishing and, and discovering container images through the public registry. And it allows you basically team collaboration and uh, automation of application workflow. But if you uh, are in a corporate environment with uh, high level security regulation, you might not want your applications to be uh, published publicly. No problem. You can actually take the hub and install it locally uh, using what we call DTR, the Docker Trusted Registry, and have exactly the same process uh, on-premise. And, uh, and to make uh, all this easy to configure and manage, Docker Trusted Registry also features a web-based admin GUI for insight into the state of a DTR host. Um, there's another concept, because, because we have such a large community, you cannot imagine how many edge cases we we'll receive about, oh, Docker is not working in this environment, oh, when I use it on this system, it's not behaving well. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's the amazing stuff that we have with so much feedback, is that we can tailor uh, the application to anybody's need, but sometimes these needs are really specific. And it doesn't make sense for us to integrate it. Uh, so what we provide in these scenarios is uh, extension endpoints using plugins. Uh, and you can customize the scheduler plugin uh, to integrate into Mesos, for instance, or the volume plugin, uh, or network plugins, or service discovery plugins. And um, to room on top of that, uh, that we just acquired is uh, really beautiful stack that's going to show a lot of potential in the next uh, few months. Um, so let's do a quick demo. Um, so now you know a little bit of the principles of the basics, and I'm going to show you a video of a uh, really great guy I work with, Anand, uh, based out of London, that's going to show you what it is to start a job um, at, with Docker. Hi. So. I'm a developer. Oh. Just done. I don't know if you guys can hear it. I guess not. So I'll do the. Huh? Oh. Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, that's not handy. 
how, how can I play a video on the screen? Can you help me with that? Sorry guys, I didn't expect that. Hold on, it looks like my computer is freezing now. <laughs> uh, it's here. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Oh, oh thank you. We've got a scaling issue. Let's try Apple F. No. no. Oh, I should have embedded into the presentation. That's a shame because I, I really have a really cool demo, but I can I can keep talking for it about it for hours anyway. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. It's like not responding. Let me kill it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then like this. Huh? Yes. The play button. Oh, the maximize button on the on this one. Okay, thank you. Sorry, guys. Resume in a minute. Oh yeah, fantastic. So this is what it looks like to start with. Uh, I'll just you, you don't you can hear the sound here, right? Okay. So here, what uh, Anna is doing is. Oh, okay. Well, it looks like you can get the sound too. Yeah. Sorry, right, it's my first time doing this uh, presentation. So I, I'm not really used to it yet. So originally Docker was um, only um, um, Linux command line uh, uh, utility because it relies on Linux features. Uh, so, uh, but we had a lot of developers uh, asking for Docker support on Windows and, uh, and Mac. Um, and this is why we came up with that solution, which is uh, using VirtualBox uh, locally to um, virtualize uh, a Linux system. Can you turn it up? And let's take a look at it. Maybe so, turn it up. yeah, there you go. The Docker Compose.yaml, they're using Docker, which means. Okay, Docker. so let's start again. Hi. So, I'm a developer. I've just started a new job at a banking company. Um, they've assigned me to work on an app of theirs, but I've got a fresh work laptop. I've got nothing set up at all. Thankfully, they're using Docker, which means that all I have to do is install the Docker toolbox and I'm ready to go. So if I go to docker.com slash docker toolbox, I can see that it's available to download for Mac and Windows. Fortunately, I've already got it downloaded right here. So I'm just going to open up the installer. We're going to go through the uh, process of installing it really quickly. Uh, and off it goes. So this is going to install several things. It's going to install the Docker engine. It's going to install Docker Compose. It's going to install Kitematic as well. Um, that's a uh, visual management tool for um, managing Docker containers and images. So let's just get that started up in the background for a moment. Um, and it also gives us the quick start terminal, which is just going to open up a uh, shell that's pointed at my Docker engine so it's ready to use. So I'm just going to cd to the directory where I've got the app application checked out. And let's take a look at it. So the docker compose.yaml contains uh, a full description of the components of our app and uh, the configuration that it needs to run. 
Uh, it's all Docker containers. We have three services. We've got web, worker, and Redis. So the web uses an image that's built from this web subdirectory here. Uh, it exposes port 5000 on the host, so we can talk to it, uh, open it up in a browser, that kind of thing. Uh, and we also mount that web subdirectory inside the container as a volume. We'll see why that is in a moment. Okay, so we've also got a worker service. That builds an image using the worker subdirectory. Uh, and finally, we've got a Redis service, which uses the official Redis image from the Docker Hub uh, and also mounts a volume. Uh, it's a named volume called My Volume, uh, and that will, uh, that will contain the uh, Redis container data. And we'll see uh, more about that in a second. So our worker is a Java app. Uh, if I have a look at its main class, we can see that it's doing some computation, connecting to a Redis up here, uh, and then storing stuff in that Redis later. Okay, um, we can also see that it's got a Docker file, which starts from the official Java image on the Docker Hub, um, uses Maven to install dependencies, uh, compiles the code, uh, and sets it up to run from this jar file it's created. Okay, so quickly then, the web is uh, a Python app. It also connects to Redis. Uh, it serves a static index page. And it has this API endpoint for reporting how much work has been done. So it also has a Docker file that uses the Python image from the Docker Hub, uh, bundles all of the stuff, installs dependencies, and uh, sets it up to run the web server. OK, so we've got those three things. All I need to do, even though I don't have Java or Python or Redis installed on my machine, is just type docker compose up. And I'm going to make use of the uh, of Compose's experimental support for networking. So I'm going to pass this flag so that it uses uh, the new networking stuff that's out in Engine 1.9. So off we go. So you can see here, first thing it's doing is building the image for web using the Python image from the Docker Hub. The next thing it's doing is pulling the Redis image from the Docker Hub. And finally, it's building the worker image um, including compiling code and that kind of thing. So that's going to be done in a second. And there we go. So we can check that's all running by, talk, by typing PS. In fact, we can flip over to Kitematic where we can see all three of these running. We've got Redis going. You can see it's producing logs as expected. Um, we can also see that Worker is running. And we can see that Web is running. And not only that, but we actually get a preview of it. Uh, we can open up the interface in our browser right here. And here we go. We can see that it's generating uh, prime, I mean, uh, processing transactions uh, at a rate of about two per second. So that's great. Now, I am actually supposed to be working on this app, not just watching it do its thing. So. Uh, Let's go back and make a change. I'm going to go into the CSS for the app. I'm just going to tweak the color for the bar chart a bit to be a bit more interesting. So if I come back to Chrome and refresh, we can see that the bars have updated. I didn't need to rebuild a container or anything like that um, because didn't need to interrupt my workflow at all because we've got the web code like mounted directly inside the container. So we've got a nice iterative development cycle. Don't have to come out of anything we're doing. We've got really, really fast updates. <laughs> OK. Um, you guys like that? Uh, so you see that um, iterative workflow, that's key. That's, that's what I like. Because you know, all the rest is complicated. It took us a long time to build. But it's, it's just plumbing. But when, when Anand just changes the CS and CSS and see it reloaded, that's exactly the direction. It's just the beginning of the kind of tools we are uh, building now. So will I be able to switch back to my presentation? Yay. So Docker Engine uh, is basically a daemon. Uh, and it has a CLI interface. Um, you, you can issue a set of small commands. It's very simple. It's very clear, uh, well-documented. And um, 
But when you want to scale it into production and address multiple nodes at the same time, uh, you can use Swarm uh, that, uh, you know, has been built by us. So it follows the same philosophy. Uh, and basically, you just register nodes into your cluster and address the, uh, the entire uh, no uh, cluster as it's just exactly the same as if it was um, running locally. So it's extremely easy to start with. And uh, not only is uh, Docker uh, open source, but it's also an open standard that we work in collaboration with a lot of companies to create what we call uh, OpenCI, an open container initiative that allows other people to, to run, to use our images, and uh, which um, brought us to write Run-C, which extracts just the core execution of um, Docker without all the pools, the build system, which other uh, competitors or partners uh, can build their own way. Uh, but we standardize on the run C to avoid fragmentation again. You know, that would be silly. Uh, we just created this common layer uh, to harmonize the execution of a process on the internet. Uh, we want everybody to follow the same principle, especially with that ad adoption. And so Solomon Ikeus <laughs> uh, said as a joke once, uh, Linux C patarat, run C patat. Uh, if Linux can do it, run C can do it. Security, security is a big concern for us. Um, and uh, because we reinvented the execution of a process of the internet, um, now that process can be built from, you saw, from many different images that are pulled from different places. You have some official um, images, such as Ubuntu. So when you uh, base your Docker file from Ubuntu, you trust Ubuntu, basically, to, uh, to write it. But you might have high-level security requirements and uh, require that any of any lines of code that is running there uh, has been validated and authorized by your uh, IT security department. Um, so what we need, of course, is signature. Uh, but again, we wanted to push things a little bit uh, further because security that is not flexible is just not security. If, if it's complicated to, to sign and push your stuff, it just doesn't work. You know, it's not because at some point you're going to have a dev that pushes his private key to GitHub and what's the point? Um, so what we did is that we partnered with YubiKey um, to design a solution uh, around a key that you can basically keep around your neck uh, and that recognizes uh, finger touch and allows you to plug the key into uh, your laptop and sign of, um, the content for distribution. Uh, and it's really great and it allows you to recover from uh, key compromises. Uh, you can very easily invalidate uh, a key and, uh, and it's very handy. And, and you know, using your finger just to sign uh, an image. How cool is that? Um, 1.9 release. I'm going to scope a little bit more on uh, what we just released uh, for DockerCon. Um, so the big headlights are network management, um, with, uh, a top-level Docker network command, which um, brings us out of the box uh, support for multi-host overlay networking. So even if these nodes couldn't see each other, magically we make them talk to, uh, to each other. Uh, and of course, again, um, it's extensible for plugins. Because yeah, there's, there's a concept that is really important to us. Uh, we call it battery included, but removable. Uh, you know, any, any part that, is, that can be, uh, need to be altered in your specific environment, we want you to be able to swap it. Not like this thing, that has battery that I cannot take off. Um, and volume management, uh, we've got Docker volume top level command as well, and uh, built in node discovery. Uh, but we also improve the uh, uh, build process refactoring, uh, which still needs some improvements, but we now support HTTP proxy, which was a high request for any one of you working in a large company, of course. Um, and quality, stability, performance improvement. You know, this, this is really uh, one of our key goals these days. Um, we, we really want to bring something that is not just working, but is really production ready. 
And the roadmap is uh, for 1.10 is progress uh, towards run C integration as a uh, runtime environment for Docker. And distribution, um, rewrite the push-pull layers. Uh, network stabilize all the new features so that we're not in experimental anymore and, uh, and all that. So, orchestration. That's a big word. That's the big place where everybody sits these days. And you have many solutions. I'm going to try to skip quite a little bit faster. Um, so what do we have? We have um, a SWAR uh, out of the box, uh, which is great. And uh, I'm going to end with a Swarm video at the end that I think is pretty cool from Andrea. And, um, You've got Swarm that can address multiple hosts, just like I told you. It exposes several uh, Docker engines as a single virtual machine, and it serves the uh, uh, standard uh, Docker API. And uh, Swarm Scatter, because you know that it's, uh, it's kind of naive to think that you can just address a bunch of, um, of nodes in the same way. Uh, you might want uh, different behavior depending on regions, uh, different behavior depending on resources, uh, maybe you need four gigs of RAM for this specific app, so it should only go on the nodes that can take it. Uh, or, you know, define uh, all kinds of sets of constraints. Uh, and we have, uh, of course, a full integration of Swarm uh, with Machine and Compose, uh, which makes all this solution work out of the box. Mesos. Mesos is a great uh, orchestration uh, layer that uh, is an open source uh, Apache project um, and it's a cluster resource manager that is scalable to t up to 10,000 nodes and it's uh, fault tolerant and it's battle tested. You know, it's uh, it's really serious application. It provides an SDK for distributed apps. And uh, just to give you an example, these are the companies that use Mesos uh, in their production environment, most of the time running Docker uh, containers underneath as well. Uh, Twitter, Airbnb, eBay, you know, it's not like uh, jokers. And it's all supported by Mesosphere, which is the corporate behind uh, Mesos that sells this solution. Uh, and um, so we have a plugin that integrates into it. Yada, yada, yada. Kubernetes, a few words on Kubernetes. Um, as I said before, you know, we didn't invent containers. Uh, containers are basically a Linux feature. Um, and Google has been using similar um, mechanics um, as, as, um, as their platform for about, for their, their own internal services for about 10 years. Uh, they've been doing process isolation, and virtual file system uh, overlay and networking and stuff like this for a long time. But they never saw the potential for uh, a larger audience. You know, they really, they really saw that as an internal tool that is here for production. You know, serious ops. Nobody would be interested into that. Um, so when they saw how um, Docker uh, became extremely popular, um, they launched Kubernetes, which starts to work now, but uh, which is which is a very good solution. But it's very complicated. You know, I picked a tweet which made me laugh. Um, what was it? I think it was, yeah. Uh, Kubernetes is so unopinated that out of the box, it's simply useless. Um, it, it has, um, you know, Kubernetes scheduler and there's this notion of pod and replication controller. A controller. You, you just have a lot to grasp. But it's probably one of the most uh, versatile tool as well. You know, I'm not uh, trying to diminish uh, its capabilities, but it's, it has a high barrier at the entry. You know, it's, it's going to take you a lot of time to get it running. Uh, well, Docker, this is what made it successful, is sim very simple and easy and, you know, solves uh, complex problems. Cloud Foundry with uh, IBM. IBM is a big partner of us. Um, we, I was, we, we sell a lot of things, but I'm going to skip through this part. This, I'm going to, I think I have, um, I'm sorry guys, because I really want to show you the, the video about uh, Swarm. I'm going to skip through from some of the slides and just jump to the summary. Um, basically, we have Docker Swarm, which is a Docker style, uh, really in-house solution. So, you know, nobody can work better uh, than us with us. Um, 
and uh, it provisions Docker machine and it's ready for production. And uh, I have great news because, uh, you know, it's been accused of not being production ready. And, yeah, you know, yeah, it, it had a few bugs and it was only working uh, into some scenarios. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a little video that shows you how, how much we worked because now we got to 1.0 and uh, I consider it production ready. Mesos, Twitter style, aligned with Swarm because we have our plugin integration. So I think it's actually, if you have a very complex scenario, this is probably the, the orchestration that you, you want to use. But, you know, if it works out of the box with Swarm, you know, you know that's, that's, that's kind of what I recommend. Uh, because this is like the, the ongoing battle these days, like should I use Mesos, Swarm is a joke, we should use Kubernetes. You know, my advice is just start with, uh, with Swarm uh, because you, you're going to have almost no effort to, to do. And, uh, and if, you, if you have more complex requirements, just switch to Mesos uh, or Kubernetes. And uh, finally, Docker and Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft is a big partner of us. Um, that's funny. I would have never guessed that. <laughs> and um, we, we, we have um, Kitematic running on their platform. Um, and uh, Docker Engine is built in, in Windows Server uh, 2016 TP3. And Yo Docker helps you transition um, normal uh, existing Dockerized uh, application and it has a, a Visual Studio integration. Ship was still um, wondering about an answer to that. It's probably going to be something around Visual Studio Online. And Run, uh, of course, Azure uh, with a Docker agent and uh, on top of user container services. So what's new with Swarm? Uh, Swarm goes stable. You know, it's, we're introducing Swarm 1.0 and uh, we're really focused on production readiness, stability, scalability, uh, scalability, sorry, performance, and uh, platform integration. And uh, we ran some tests, and I'm going to show you a video about that. Uh, we have about uh, a thousand nodes uh, on AWS, and um, it has parallel scheduling. Um, and uh, it reached uh, EC2 provisioning limit, you know, really. Um, you know, we, we asserted uh, performance, and I think that we got really low, you know, uh, median one, uh, 170 milliseconds. That's not bad. Um, and stability, we stress tested under heavy load, you know, because so far it was, it was kind of a, or um, kind of not, perfectly stable and now it, it is it is awesome and I'm gonna now show you a little video that demonstrate it so yeah yeah that's easier okay so here I'm doing uh, well it's Andrea it's Andrea's demos uh, docker info and I'm showing you verse 10 nodes so on this uh, graph you see each vertical line represents a node, and each layer represents a set of containers. Uh, so I'm going into the source code of my application. I'm doing a Docker Compose up, and you see the little colors shows the five components of this application. You've got Redis, a Java worker, uh, a web front end. It's a voting application. You know, it's very simple. It's actually what a lot of agencies spend their time doing, uh, voting applications for uh, brands. And here we did something quite controversial, Star Trek versus Star Wars. Uh, you see, this is the front end to click. Oh, uh, Star Trek 100% and Star Wars, whoa, an incredible swing uh, in the polls. Um, and so now, I'm just, uh, that application got pushed to Facebook and, it, uh, and it's starting to have a lot of, of uh, load. So now I just did Docker Compose scale 50 and now I have 50 containers running it uh, for the workers. I just specified I want 50 workers here. And I'm gonna, now the, the application got super viral. Oh my God, what am I doing now? So we're going, jumping to the AWS console and adding the limit of uh, 990 instances. So that video has sped up, of course. Uh, I wish AWS could launch so many instances that fast. But here we have uh, 990 nodes uh, running on AWS. Uh, 
So it's going to spin them up. And using the events, we see them uh, populating our graph that, that is becoming a circle. And you see the number of containers at, at the top and the number of active nodes. And that's a thousand. There you go. And now we're going to start spreading uh, all these containers over all these nodes and all this, this cluster of, um, of containers. And uh, you've got the worker and um, uh, the NGINX um, that are represented into different colors. And what you can see here is that as the containers are being spun, uh, spun up, uh, you can see that an even distribution across all the nodes. And this is all uh, handled automatically by Swarm uh, to make sure that you know you, you don't have like 10 nodes and uh, really working and 900 <laughs> and doing nothing. And uh, just to show you that it's not just a fluke uh, and that you can actually, even when you have a thousand node, uh, add and or remove a few containers. You see here we have uh, 1,000 nodes, which ends up being uh, 50,000 containers. And we're just going to add another Redis <coughs> and time it. Bing. Half a second. It's running, you see. And remove it. There you go. So thank you. Uh, that's, that was for the demo. Uh, hold on. I think I, I still have a few slides. Uh, so yeah, fire up your first container today and uh, start hacking, guys. I think uh, if you never touched it, uh, your mind's just going to go. It's, it's one of the most amazing technology I've ever seen. And if you want to learn, here are a few links uh, that uh, I recommend as a starting point. Of course, the docs. And, but you'll see the, the amount of, of data and content around Docker that is available on the internet is crazy. And finally, we're hiring. Uh, we're a very fast-growing uh, company with a valuation uh, to $1 billion now. Uh, we, we, we just doubled the number of developers over the last nine months. And uh, I wish we had some time for Q&A, but I don't want to, you know, off, uh, make the schedule off. So what about I'm ready for lunch. See if anybody, any one of you wants to, to come with me. You're welcome. It's my first time. In <laughs>